Hello everyone, my name is Samuel Grubinger and I'm also at the Integrated Remote Sensing Studio at the University of British Columbia. And I'm going to be talking to you about the work that I've done using some of the same data sets as Francois, but unlike Francois, I'm looking at stand-level phenotypic differences, so the phenotyping of forests rather than individual trees, and I'm looking at sites across the breeding zone to try to get at some site-level differences to characterize phenotypes across the breeding zone. So, Fratel went over some of this, but I think it's worth reiterating. Uh, in British Columbia, we breed trees primarily for timber production. All of the trees that have breeding programs are economically valuable trees, and uh, it's funded by the government because most of the productive land in British Columbia along the coast is subject to this cycle of harvest and reforestation. It's continually being replanted using seed that comes primarily from genetically improved sources, tree breeding trials, tree breeding programs, um, so that it can be harvested at rotation age. And the trees can grow quite quickly here, so that's usually 40 or 50 years. On top of that, there is some interest in pathogen resistance for the species that have been hit hard by invasive pathogens. Um, and we are concerned with wood quality as well. So we, we don't select any trees that exhibit a decrease in wood density. We don't want to select for wood quantity at the expense of wood quality. Um, and finally, a successful tree breeding program is to produce genetic material that will do well across the breeding zone at, at a variety of sites because this will be deployed throughout the province. But trees are very challenging to breed because they're big, they're slow, and they're sensitive. They're very large, so they're hard to measure, especially once canopy closure occurs, um, and especially in the upper canopy, which is really where the action happens, right? That's where the trees are actively photosynthesizing and growing. Uh, they're quite slow, so unlike for agricultural crops where we can have many, many selection cycles within a year or two, you have to wait decades in between generations for trees. And they're extremely plastic. Their phenotypes are extremely sensitive to the environment where they're growing. They have low heritability in a lot of their phenotypic traits, meaning that how tall a tree grows is more a function of the environment where it's growing and competition from the other trees growing around it than from its genotype necessarily. So selecting these trees based on their phenotypes is a big challenge. So as Francois mentioned, uh, we overcome this by, by planting, planting trees in essentially a simulation of an operational forestry environment. We plant them in rows at sites that are spread throughout the breeding zone, and we quantify their performance as a stand, as a forest, rather than as individual trees. Um, and we express the success or failure of selections in terms of realized genetic gain. So that is the improvement over a control population, locally collected seed, at a given set. Um, and Francois went over the two levels of genetic improvement that were tested in these trials. So we actually flew three of these sites across the province, um, and these three sites represent the productivity gradient. So we have a very productive, warm, wet site in the south. This has high rainfall in the winter, Mediterranean climate, very fertile. We have Lang Bay, which Francois talked about. That's an intermediate site in the rain shadow of Vancouver Island. And then we have Spirit Lake on northern Vancouver Island, which experiences colder winters and is less productive. That's at the northern, northern end of the range of those fur on the coast here. Uh, we flew we flew the Bellingham Puck, as you know, the DGI is 600, so I'm just going to highlight some key differences here. We flew quite low, 35 meters, um, produced very dense point clouds, and this is key, we needed to include a larger range of scan angles in order to have full coverage of the plot. So we're going out to about 40 degrees here, which is much higher than a traditional airborne acquisition would be. But we produced a solid data set. This is, uh, this is measured tree height from a 2015 survey, so this is the tallest, the tallest tree in each plot compared to the Z-max from our 
normalized coin pop data. And considering that there's a three-year gap there, that's a, a fairly strong relationship. Um, likewise, we did produce leaf area index estimates of active LAI and compare them to LAI 2000 ground measurements that we collected in the spring directly after our acquisitions. And so it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. Uh, the LAI proxy from LIDAR tends to stay high, but it is in the year and we see, we see a strong relationship there. And when we subjectively examine our plots, these are segmented plots of six by six trees, in my case, we can see evident differences among the genetic groups. Uh, so the focus of my work was really to find metrics that would objectively quantify these differences in genetic gain that we're seeing. We know that LiDAR can tell us which trees are taller, which stands are taller, um, and so part of the challenge for me was to find well, what additional metrics can give us information. Because we can see it's not just that these trees are taller, it's that this stand is growing quite differently. You see a much more even stand, you see much more competition, competitive individuals there than in the wild stand, where you see mortality, you see canopy gaps, you see variability. So I produced a suite of point cloud metrics that we hypothesized might be descriptive of physiological differences in these stands that could stand in for phenotypes. Um, pretty standard height percentiles. We also produced canopy cover, LAI, canopy relief ratio, and then we voxelized the point clouds and produced uh, volume estimates of open gap space within the canopy filled canopy space, that's voxels occupied by foliage, and uh, closed canopy space, that's empty voxels below the canopy. Um, and finally, some heterogeneity, heterogeneity metrics, the rumble index, coefficient of variation, and vertical complexity index. So this is the important part. Uh, those metrics on their own aren't very informative because we see quite drastic differences from site to site. Uh, at Robertson, a very productive site, we see much, much taller trees, and the other metrics vary, vary by site as well. So the, the magnitude of magnitude of change among genetic levels is dwarfed by the magnitude of change from site to site. So what I did was normalize all of these remote sensing metrics to terms of realized genetic gain, and this this technique is taken directly from, from tree breeding. This is how ground-based phenotypic measurements are treated. Um, you essentially treat the mean of your control plots as zero for every trait, and you get a percent increase or decrease for each plot. And now we see much more consistent relationships, and we can now make some comparisons, even among plots of different spaces at different sites. We use stepwise, stepwise regression to produce a suite of candidate models, um, and then performed well. The one we chose was a simple model using the mean height of returns within the canopy, above the canopy threshold, and this leaf area index proxy that we produced. Um, and we chose this model partially because it performed well, and partially because this model was, makes heuristic sense. It offers a physiological explanation for these increases. Any, any increase in trunk growth that's not a function of increased height, trees growing taller, is likely to come from horizontal increases in foliage, uh, increasing photosynthetic capacity of, of the stand. And this model performs very well. Uh, we see very consistent relationships across sites. Um, and most importantly, I think we see consistent, we see relatively similar coefficients in the model. We're not interested in, in metrics that can be parameterized wildly from site to site. We're interested in, in indicators of genetic gain that are fundamental in this, in this system. So to conclude, you know, none of the none of the metrics that we produce are novel in and of themselves, but treating remote sensing metrics as phenotypes is what's novel about, about my work. Um, and 
you see that pipe metrics are by far the strongest, the strongest predictors that we know. There are no candidate models that didn't have a pipe metric in them. Um, so at least, at least in the scans that we're measuring, uh, genetic gain is largely explained by pipe gain. So I think this offers some support for this technology as a phenotyping platform in treating troubles. But moving beyond just the context of the existing breeding framework, um, this technology I think could really help us get at this question of genotype by environments interaction. These, these plots that we flew were set up to simulate operational stands planted across British Columbia. Um, and we know that there's vast variation in how, how stands perform in the province, and that this variation is likely to increase as the climate changes. Uh, the ranges of those for, are expected to shift across, across the coast. And so the province is covered by stands like this, even-aged plantation forests that come from known archived genetic material, a known genetic value, and having this rapid phenotypic platform that allow us to move beyond these painstakingly slow plantation trials to go out and collect data in the field, to go out and, and fly some of these forests that we have across the province. So some of the questions we still need to address is, you know, would, would our modeling results be the same using using an airborne system. Uh, we don't, we can't be sure that these metrics aren't just a function of the system we use. We know that the Velvety Pup has some, some quirks around it, um, and so we're hoping to validate, validate some of these findings with other acquisitions. Um, as Francois mentioned, we have some spectral data that, that could add, add to the power, add to the predictive power here. Um, and what I think is the most important thing to test is different age classes. Because all of our sites are the same age, we can't really know if the changes we're seeing are true genetic gain or if they're just ecological succession, right? If the, if the control plots catch up to the improved plots within the next few decades, then, then those metrics aren't indicating genetic gain application age, they're just indicating genetic gain as young in forests. Um, and finally, I think it would be interesting to try to use remote sensing metrics for some of these wood attributes and pathogen resistance attributes that are much more difficult to measure in the field. So thank you very much. I'll take questions.